Fireside Chat, episode 23, A Thrilling Start, recorded October 7th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. We're a week into the 2013 NHL season, and the Flames have got four of a possible six points so far. Impressing a lot of people, and we're back with another episode of Fireside Chat. We want to remind everyone that you can follow us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or you can subscribe to the show, which we recommend everybody do. Go to our website, hit the subscribe button, subscribe through the, to the show through the website, we're on iTunes. You can rate and review us there and tell your friends about us because it's a new change in the flames and we want everyone to join us as we dissect this team going forward all year. And as usual, Matt and Lucas are with me. How are you guys doing? Very good. Good, good. Welcome, people of Calgary and the world. So, guys, the flames have got four of a possible six points, three games into the season. What do you think? Better than expected. Honestly, I wouldn't even say better than expected. I'd say... If this was going to happen, it would it was going to happen off the top, where they're going to come out gangbusters, and uh, I think, obviously, at a certain point, there's going to be a drop-off, but it's uh, it's pretty good so far. So Montreal Wednesday night, do you think they can keep up the momentum? Well, yeah, it's Montreal. They're a bunch of small players, so, yeah, physically, they'll just push them over. And then New Jersey on Friday? Who knows? I, I couldn't tell you enough about New Jersey, but I do think in the long run they're going to look at Kovalchuk abandoning them as as a blessing. But, I mean, I, I don't know. I, the, 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 the building should be fairly electric. I think the, the devil-may-care sort of attitude they've got on the attack and the fact that they're all moving their feet, drawing penalties... Uh, very few passengers. I think that's resonating with the fans. We're not watching the same bunch of country club veterans just sort of try and whatever. They're just there to cash a check. Uh, I, I think this, this team already has uh, connected more with the fans than the last couple of years worth of Flames efforts. Yeah, and with the, their efforts, like you can actually see on the ice that they're giving it their all. And while they are making some mistakes, that's natural with a team like the Flames are now. But giving such a good effort is instilling a very good set of habits moving forward. And especially, like, next year and the year beyond. You know, like, if you're not giving a good concerted effort, you're going to just be spinning your tires like a team up north. So, yeah, for sure. And like just giving good effort, not quitting. Like the way they tied up the game against Vancouver last night was terrific. And in many cases, I think last year, we wouldn't have seen a bunch of things that we saw last night. Like that shift where they kept the Canucks hemmed in after that power play for, you know, close to a minute. And, you know, unfortunately they didn't capitalize, but. That was as dominant a shift of Flames hockey as I think you've seen in several calendar years. Yeah, and one of the things that's been noteworthy is how uh, they're able to get the other teams off of their game because of how relentless their forecheck is. Yeah, just like, ultimately, this is the this is the thing that I think the the last couple generations of this team forgot, which was, uh, like, hit them in the mouth. Go right at them. Take them out of their comfort zone. I, I get the feeling that a lot of teams were very, very comfortable when they played the Calgary Flames, going back to probably 2009. Certainly as soon as Phaneuf left. I think everyone got way comfier playing them. Yeah, because like, they were relying more so on their talent, which they did have, and like that's one of the common complaints of Flames fans is that they were always a very talented team on paper, but they always seemed to disappoint on the ice. Yeah, I remember last year when I was working at the Dome, I remember looking at all the the Every Game Matters posters, the you know big 20-foot 
pictures of Tange and Glenn Cross and Aginla and just being like, this team, when I, like when I first moved to Calgary in 2000, this team has got so much more talent on it than those teams did. And yet, in nearly every respect, it's worse. Mm-hmm. It's all the little things. Yeah. Like like having Mike Camilleri's promotional photo on that 20-foot billboard be of him wearing a 93 jersey instead of a 13. I don't know why, but that... or I know, I, I do know why. That, that always struck me as something just like it would take so little effort to fix it, but you've elected to go with something wrong because you're lazy. <laughs> Dan, what about you? you? You've been you've been quiet. What have you got to say? You know, I'm. It's early for us to be diagnosing this team. I mean, we're three games into the season. There's lots of games left, but I think the thing, the the thing that's interesting to me is, I guess, just the way that this team seems to have come together. It doesn't seem like what I've seen from the last teams, which seemed almost like a group of freelancers trying to um, each make their claim and show why they should be perhaps the elite guy or the number two center. This seems like a team that's everyone seems comfortable in their role. They know what their role is, and they're just working for the greater good, which I it's been a while since we've seen a team like that here in Calgary. I would, I would almost argue the opposite, that I think that because everybody isn't settled, because I think everybody outside of a couple people on this team know they are very, very replaceable, that they are putting themselves in a position to succeed by doing, you know, something we're not used to seeing around here, like listening to the coach. Like, you look at the way everyone's playing, yeah, they're, they're buying in and they're listening they're being taught. Yeah, and the one very good motivator is having Corbin Knight, Roman Horak, Ben Hanowski, Max Reinhardt, John Furland, and like several other guys that are on the farm ready to take jobs if you're not performing well. So, you know, that added pressure makes them more apt to listen to the coach and play the system the right way. Because their job's on the line, too. Oh, for sure. And I think that's definitely a motivator, is that these guys know they can be replaced. But I think each one of the guys we're bringing up knows what their strengths are, knows what their weaknesses are, and knows what they have to do or what they have to try to do to keep a job on this team. I suppose so, and there's definitely less of guys being asked to do things they aren't capable of. Uh, there, there is, there definitely seems to be much more of a play within yourself, and I know some people hate that expression, but just recognizing almost shortcomings and not expecting certain players to be able to center number one lines, i.e., Como, uh, just it, the the whole roster. The, the, I don't know. Maybe there's more of a, a clear vision. Well, and what you were saying earlier about everyone allowing themselves to be taught, I think there's a trust in this coaching staff too. So if you're a young guy or even a veteran and the coaches say, go out and do it this way or go out and do this, there's a trust that, okay, I'll trust you guys and I'll go do it that way because that's what we need or that's what you think is best for me. Yeah, and, you know, as Matt said, we can't underscore the value of how many players are on the farm who played significant NHL minutes last year? To say nothing of, you know, especially in the top six, you know, you have to think that they're well aware that, you know, come March, uh, John Gaudreau is probably going to be breathing down their necks as well. Like, they are, the veterans on this team are really under siege in terms of being able to be complacent. Yeah, that's true. And even even the young guys can't be complacent. I mean, a guy like Lance Buma, who started the year here, doesn't mean he's going to finish the year here. So he needs to quickly find his role on the team and quickly assert to this team why they should keep him in Calgary. I think he's already done that in a sense. I, I, I mean, I know he has to keep it up, but, I mean, Boma seems like one of those guys who, just based on his preseason, he's already got a goal early on. Uh, he... He, he seems like a guy who is very aware 
that his career was almost over with his knee injury. And he is, again, very aware that he needs to prove that he belongs. And to th thus far, he's been very, very impressive. I I've loved every shift I've seen from him. You know, it's funny you bring up the knee injury, because I was just thinking about the injury situation today. If you think about the Flames for the last couple seasons, they've come close to the postseason a few times, and they've always been derailed by injuries. And I guess it's both a blessing and a curse, but the one year we're probably not going to make it close to the postseason, I feel like we finally have the depth that we would have needed in some of those other seasons. Got days where we can say, okay, you're hurt, sit it, don't make it worse. We'll call somebody up, and we're fairly capable they can do the job for a couple days. I do think that this team is capable of d doing the sort of thing where, like, yeah, you, you know, if any, you know, I don't know, say Galliardi gets hurt, we call up Panowski, and I don't think we see a huge drop-off. However, that high point is obviously going to be, I think, a bit lower. Although maybe it's not. Maybe they surprise us all. We had some surprises last year with some of the guys they pulled up near the end of the season. Yeah, I, I mean more that the team will surprise us as 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 like playing above above their heads and you know, being in the postseason hunt you know past January, which which would be cool. I, I think they may be in that hunt. I don't think they will end up in the postseason. No, I I oh God no. I I still think this is a team destined for the bottom three teams in the league, just because I don't think they have the horses, but. I would hope they'd be able to stay competitive, and then okay, you run out of gas, but that's what happens. Is as the song goes, you gotta lo you gotta lose to know how to win. So I mean, that's what this year is about. So talking about the postseason hunt, um, let me throw this question out to you guys, and then I'll give you my thoughts. Based on what we talked about last week and seeing the team over the first couple of games here, has your opinion changed of where you think the Flames will end up at the end of the season in the standings? Definitely not. Like. It, it their effort is really good and it's encouraging to see that they're willing to follow the coaching staff's direction but they just do not have the talent to get that next step and you know like it, it the the hockey will be entertaining and it you know it should be anyway if they keep this style up but I just don't see them having enough raw talent on their team to compensate for the deficits that they have. Yeah, I, I'd agree 100% with Matt. My opinion hasn't changed. As I just said, I still think they're a bottom three team in the league. They, they are going to be fun. They're going to try. They're going to give teams hell, which is all you can really expect from them, given the makeup of this roster. But just... Based on the first three games, uh, we our goaltending I, I would describe it as scrappy. It, it, it like Joey McDonald last night made a couple unreal saves, but there are certainly there, there's just deficiencies in talent that ultimate at this level you, you just can't overcome. Yeah, like that you need to go out and get like another Kipper type, like someone that's actually capable of being a star-ish caliber goalie, and those type of goalies don't really grow on trees. So, <laughs> you know, and we don't really even need one right now anyway because of our current situation. I, I see, I understand that train of thought, but at the same time, um, basic, like, I, I feel like it's almost a disservice to neglect that as a as looking to upgrade that position i mean i know we all at least i think we all have a feeling that gillies is the long-term answer in net however it wouldn't hurt to have a sort of situation where while we're waiting for our gillies our jonathan bernier that we discover jonathan quick whoever that may be and while dan you're right goalies don't grow on trees they do seem to live under rocks uh, so it's it's very important, I think, to leave no stone unturned. And if the organization has managed to make the evaluation by the midpoint that uh, Barra, Ramo, and McDonald are not the answer, then I think it is incumbent upon them to look as hard as possible to, at upgrading that position. Yeah. 
Oh no, like going into next season, like if all three of Barrow Ramo and, and McDonald are not providing adequate goaltending, then you maybe throw Ordeo in for a few games towards the end of the year. You go look at overseas, maybe there's another guy that, like Anti Ranta or, you know, some of the other older prospects that have come over. And, you know, see, you know, you gotta keep turning it over until you get someone that's actually halfway decent. Oh yeah, for sure. It, uh, to this point, the glaring issues with the goaltending thus far, and Matt, maybe you'll agree with me, uh, Joey McDonald's side to lateral movement is nightmarish at the NHL level. Though, again, very scrappy player. He's going to try hard. You can't fault him for that. He is what he is. I like I like Joey Mack more and more every time I watch him play the game. Uh, Kari Ramo, I need to see him play more. But there's just a... Uh, I, I don't know. There Maybe consistency is the word I'm searching for. But there's something... There's a vibe I get from him that uh, doesn't necessarily instill confidence. I get a better vibe from Barra, but Barra isn't ready, I don't think. Uh, you know, I, uh, my thought on where this team is going to finish as far as postseason or not hasn't changed. I do think we might see the Flames in the postseason hunt up until Christmas, just because if they can come out with a hot start, which again is uncharacteristic for the Flames, um, they might be able to play there, but I definitely think it's going to fall off, and namely due to the goaltending. Um, I think, you know, as much as we talk about upgrading, I think that it's a team that we have to do what we've done with every other position on this team. And over time, we will draft into it, we'll trade into it, we will upgrade it, but it's not a one-season fix. And I think we're also used to having Kipper there that we perhaps don't realize the struggles and what it takes to fill an empty um, starting goalie position. A second-round pick and Ben Scrivens, apparently. <laughs> Well, I mean, we, we traded away a second-round pick for Kipper at the time. So, yeah, maybe a second-round pick is the key to, to fill in this that's position. The, I think that's the going rate for backup goalies that you think could be franchise guys, a second-round pick and something else. And it, I don't know who necessarily falls into that category at this stage of the game, but, you know, it's something I think you you should look long and hard at. And one one guy, I mean, this is... I'm pulling this name out of thin air, but assuming a cert, certain things go wrong for him in certain situations, I'd be okay in a year or so. Uh, if, uh, if we went after Carey Price, I'd be fine with that. I think if that dude got out of Montreal and that hellhole hell of, a, of a goalie environment... Um, I think he could rebound very well here, uh, but that, but this 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 just occurred to me. This is not a an actual rumor, or a trade thought, or anything yeah. like that. If we're going to like look at possibilities, I think the St. Louis Blues might actually be a good source because they have Halak, Elliot, and Jake Allen, all of whom are pretty much equivalently talented. So. You know, like, you could probably get Elliot for, like, a second-round pick-ish. I I don't trust Elliot as far as I can throw him, and my back's bad. Uh, I would definitely try and target Halak or... or yeah, Hunt, but... Brian Elliott's the... You know what I mean? Like, it, it's one of yeah, those yeah. where maybe if... Yeah. Well... I see what you're saying, though, because it's sort of the same situation in a sense that San Jose was in when they dealt Kiprasov, because they had three NHL-worthy goalies. They had to get rid of one. So, you know, lucky us. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget that about Kiprasov, is we did not acquire him as an NHL starter. We acquired him as a third-string guy who was actually brought in to back up Roman Turek. He was not brought in to be the starter, and he proved his way into that starting job and into an elite goaltending job. So, yeah, I think we all forget because we've seen him here for so long in that elite goalie job. That's not how we hired him. That's not how we found him. No, that's true. Oh, by the way, uh, talk amongst yourselves while I actually figure out or, or find this uh, 
this statistic here. But do you guys have any idea what Roman Turek's numbers were the season we acquired Kiprasov? I have no idea. Considering it was Roman Turek and the Flames weren't going anywhere at the time, probably not that not that but, impressive. But what would, if, if you were to just, I don't know, put, put a guess on it. Well, wasn't uh, Turk actually hurt when we got Kipper, and like that's why we got him? Well, I think we got him to back up Turk, and then Turk got hurt right away after, if I remember. We correctly. no, we did get him to Turk got hurt. We made a trade for Kiprasov, and that was that was that. But, and I understand under, I understand these numbers are a bit colored considering Kiprasov would set at, at one point for the time the single season goals against record which was shattered by interestingly enough Brian Elliott uh but uh Roman Turk's numbers uh 2.33 goals against average which isn't terrible but that's also the season where he won six games and lost 11 and only played in 18 of them. Yeah. So well, no, I'm just... If you, if you go to the season before where he was in 65, it was 2.57. Yeah. So still still not bad, but you got to look at a better body of work than just 18 games, I think. No, I don't disagree. I'm just I'm just saying, you know, he... Uh... He wasn't bad. He, I don't think he... you got to remember, though, d- during that whole Turk era... The, yeah, but this was also the era when, as Flames fans, we were excited when Freddie Brathwaite was our savior and goal for a couple of years. Freddie played hard. He was he's a black Joey McDonald. That's pretty accurate, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's a, he's a scrappy guy. He makes some nice saves, but ultimately, he's very limited in what he can do. And you know, it's there's nothing wrong with that. He is what he is. Yeah, but I'm just saying that at the time, I mean, we had Ken Reggett, we had Roman Turek, we were going through all these kind of washed up goalies, and at the time, we didn't, we didn't yeah, know the good Yeah, Tabarachi, K. Whitmore, around, you know. Yeah, exactly, Tabarachi, there was all sorts of them, so when, when Kipper came around, I know I probably rolled my eyes at the time thinking, oh great, it's just another retread, somebody's, you know, third string goaltender, so we may have to go through that process again here with Ramo and getting them, you know, up to speed at the NHL level and that sort of thing. I'm not saying he's the next Kipper by any means, but I think we have to give him some time to see what he's got. Oh, uh, for sure. Now, and I will say this, Kiprasov, and admittedly, he came into a D- Daryl Sutter defensive system. But Kiprasov, as soon as he came into the into the fold, literally game one, he was undeniable. Well, wait, and I, that that's in that first game, he it? didn't he like lose six five to Montreal. No, no, that was like two or three games in. It was at that game. It was against Colorado, and he'd had a really good like run of three starts prior to that, and then he played the Abs, which at still at that time had mostly prime a tail end of the prime Sackick and Forsberg and you know that dream team and you know they still had all the their def- they still had Rob Blake you know David Abisher was in net but you know that was the 6-5 game yeah I remember but at the same time Kipper didn't look that good when he when he was in net for San Jose in previous seasons so I think it took him a while to even get adjusted to the NHL game and get his uh, position and his style going at the NHL level. For sure. I'm just saying that when he arrived here, he was undeniable. And that's what you have to look for in a goalie. That's what your goalie should be striving for. And if they're not undeniable, they should be replaceable. Why the Edmonton Oilers have seen fit to stick with Devin Dubnik when he's been anything but undeniable is, you know, why they're the Oilers. Get on our weekly dose of Oiler bashing, but... On the- Not just Dubnik, but they decided that the best compliment to Dubnik this year was Jason LaBarbera. Yeah, well, that that's kind of like the Kansas City Chiefs last year saying it's going to be a quarterback competition, and then going out and signing Brady Quinn. It it is it is a yeah Dubnik's your starter, but only because you have the other worst goalie in the league that you could find. Because apparently, even Curtis McElhaney's not taking your phone calls. <laughs> And yeah, before I, I saw someone say, "Oh, McElhaney wasn't even that bad of a backup." Yes, he was. He couldn't win games against bottom feeders. We wouldn't send him out against anyone who was currently situated higher than twenty fifth in the overall standings. And it took him eighteen goddamn months to win a game. 
My shooter tutor was a better goalie than Curtis McElhaney was yes, here. Yes, better rebound control. Yeah, exactly. And at least you know that it's got some parts of the net covered. Well, McElhaney actually has an NHL backup job. He's the He made the NHL this year in Columbus. Well, Bobrovsky's going to play 70 games, right? Okay. But even here, I mean, when we put McElhaney in for three or four games, it was disastrous. Yeah. It's just, it's... By the way, speaking of the Oilers, they're currently trailing New Jersey 3-0, so... Right. Going for 0-3. Start. Nice. It's not Kevin Lowe. He's not the problem. Certainly not. So guys, going kind of segueing from the goalies, um, let's talk about Monaghan here. He's really impressed me the first three games. I think that he looks like a guy who deserves a, a better, perhaps better than nine uh, games in this league this year. I'd what do you guys him. think? I, th- I think I would as well. I'd keep him. I'd also, I'd throw in that I would release him to go play at the World Juniors because I don't think we're going to need him that much. Yeah, we we can afford to release him for that, and it would be great experience. Uh, but yeah, um, like first game, I, I only saw bits and pieces of it. I was trying to catch it while I was at work, but uh, apparently he looked a bit overwhelmed, which I suppose is understandable in your first NHL game. But he picked up an assist. Second game, he gets his first goal. Th- last night against Vancouver, uh, he like that goal he scored where like just looked off the goalie and the defender all the way and then just rifles it like that's that's a five-year veteran goal. yeah and skill wise and like his conditioning like i think he's still like well an 18 year old and he might burn out part of the way through the season but it, the way he thinks the game is at an absolute elite level and you know can't ask anything more than that no, he's he's been he's been terrific. I've yeah. He made a couple just very small plays where like he blocked off centering passes with his skates, just really heady defensive plays that just yeah, he's he's an NHL player. His skating's not quite there yet, but he's not he's not behind the play. He's he'll he'll be fine. He need I think he, it's uh get your Sean Monahan jerseys, folks. Well, when I was first watching him in the first game and even the second game, I said I turned to uh, my friend who I was watching with and said, "This guy looks like a guy who's playing beyond his years." You know, one of you just said that he looked like a, a you know make a move that a five year veteran would make, and yeah, he doesn't look like a rookie on the ice. He's playing like a guy who has played in this league for a couple of years, and knows what he's actually doing. Just wait until he actually fills out properly and adjusts entirely, like he. I you know I wouldn't be shocked if he was our first line center for the next decade. So good, good draft pick unanimously. Yeah. Cap future captain serious. So guys, here's a this is the uh, question that the Flames have on their website for this week for their fan poll, and I thought it was an interesting question, so I'll throw it in here. Which Flames newcomers impressed you the most in the first three games this year? Are we including Monahan? All right, let, let's not include him because we just gushed all over him. So, I'll give you the list of names the Flames have on the site if that helps. We've got Galliardi, Chris Russell, Kerry Ramo, Dave Jones, Shane O'Brien, and Joe Colburn. Definitely for me, it would be TJ Galliardi. He is just as, as good of a four checker as I've ever seen. And yeah, like he did have that one stupid penalty, but. You know, he, he's been all that and then some for us. So, like, I would actually like to see him retained for a long time. Yeah, I'd like to see him retained for a while. Yeah, he, uh, Galliardi's been good. David Jones has been way better than I thought he would be. Uh, and, yeah, and Chris Russell has also, like, for a top four guy who's playing a top four role and he's not really... I, I I don't think most people would consider him a top four guy. He's been playing very well. He's been making good decisions with the puck. He's been playing with more jam than Bo Meester did for 
the majority of his See, this is what uh, the we, Flames were we hoping that they were getting in Butler. <laughs> Ex- yeah, yeah, I, pretty I much. Bet. It's Butler do over. Yeah, if, if Butler was Russell, he 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 could he could work at my cocktail party. From that list, I think that for me, I agree. TJ Galliardi, I I knew we were getting a good player in Galliardi, but I, I'm getting more than I expected out of him. But for me, the number one newcomer that I've been most impressed with is Lance Buma so far. I don't even consider him a newcomer, though, because he's he's been with the big club for parts of... Well, you, you finished up, not last season, but the year before with the Flames. Uh, you know, he, he, he's he's homegrown. Yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, Dave Jones, Matt, you were right. I'm really liking Dave Jones. I think he's he's uh, he was a good acquisition for what we gave up for him. I'm I'm really happy with that acquisition. He's certainly playing with more jam than uh, than Tange would. Yeah, or or um, Sarich. I actually, I I would, I'll say, I would rather have Sarich than Shane O'Brien at the moment. Sarich never got enough credit when he was here. He was a really solid stay-at-home defenseman who made a decent first pass was the only guy who would hit or fight and block shots like he he basically replaced Rhett Warner he did and honestly I I think one of the big mistakes that they made when Keenan first got here was breaking up the Phaneuf Sarich pairing because that actually worked really well I think I could have been wrong. I remember liking them together. Yeah, Matt, when you said that he replaced Warner, that's exactly what I was thinking is. You know what, he he had a lot of the traits when he was here that Rhett Warner displayed, and I think people were used to Rhett Warner in that role, and I would argue Rhett Warner was perhaps better in that role. Oh, definitely. Although, if you think about it, you you might remember coming out of the lockout, there was a game against Vancouver on Hockey Night in Canada where Rhett Warner just destroyed Todd Bertuzzi with a hip check to his chest, sent his helmet popping off, and, you know, jotted him all the way back to the bench. It was it was terrific. And it was right about the same spot where Corey Sarich destroyed Marlowe in, uh, in that playoff series against San Jose. So Luke, you had uh, mentioned before the show that you wanted to get, um, you wanted to chat about fighting tonight. You got some stuff you want to get off your chest. I do. And first of all, I'll ask you guys this: uh, fighting in in the wake of the George Peros incident, which is about a hundred times more the result of a freak accident than it is because of fighting. That that's you know, it is what it is. What should does fighting have a place in the game? We'll go Dan and then Matt. I've never been a big fan of fighting. I've always, I've always said, you know what, we we need contact in the game. Contact can't be taken out, which it never will at the NHL level. But I personally don't think fighting needs a place in the game. It's a waste of a roster spot to hold on to an enforcer. It is, I mean, by all intents and purposes, it is against the rules. There's a five minute major for it. So yeah, I'm, I've never been a big fighting fan myself. I know a lot of people are, and I know that there's the stereotypical, we need to keep it in the game for the Americans, but if I was in Bettman's position, I would definitely look at taking fighting out of the game. Me personally, like I don't like the staged fighting where you have the one fighter fight the other fighter just to get the fight out of the way. But, you know, like... I remember, like, in 04, when Aginla fought Le Cavalier in the finals. Like, that was, you know, like, he was venting his frustration, and, you know, like, getting rid of that, I'm not, you know, like, there's even fighting in baseball. Like, you know, it doesn't happen often, but it does have a place. No, but those kind of fights will still happen, but it just yeah. might be a more severe penalty like, for those what, guys. What I would do is make it so that, like, uh, takedowns like Wilson uh, gave Buma, uh, like, I would actually have that be an additional five-minute major and a game misconduct for attempt to injure, which would help to make fighting itself a little safer. I... I don't know, like, it's really a tough question because you can't, you know, like, each side, 
You can't yeah. outlaw one and not the other either. Well, but for, for sure, you could make... You, th- th- there could be something in the rules to make fighting, like give it well, give it more rules, give it more structure, so it's not just a brawl. There is sort of more form to it. There's like, okay, that's an illegal, you know, that's an illegal move. Like even the UFC and boxing, like you can't rabbit punch someone. Like th- there's th- there's decorum, there's Queensbury rules and fighting fair and all that sort of stuff, and. Matt, I understand what you're saying about, you know, you don't want the the enforcers just there to fight and then not play again. However, even those sort of fights can serve a role. I, 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 re- I refer you back to a game uh, featuring the Minnesota Wild wherein Derek Bugard, uh, rest in peace, uh, basically ran around and I believe the person he injured or came close to injuring was Chuck Kobasu. And the Flames didn't have an answer for him. And, you know, it was a big deal. And then the next time we played Minnesota, they'd called up Eric Goddard. Eric Goddard and Bugard fought off the draw, and Goddard lit him up. He put him on his ass, and it completely changed the, you know, changed momentum. That serves a role. That There is a purpose to that sort of fight. Another random example, when, you know, there was a moment where Iginla and Jovanovski, when Jovanovski was playing in Phoenix, you know, square, you know, Iginla drives Jovo back into the net. <laughs> they cross check back and forth, and they're like, "Okay, let's let's do this." And they take off their helmets, they drop their gloves, they square off, and it's a moment that's so badass and so full of character and 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 respect that in a world where, you know. Don't we live like okay? Don't smoke within ten feet, ten yards of a door because of secondhand smoke, and don't, you know, don't do anything that could ever possibly result in you being hurt. Don't, don't take any risk whatsoever. Play it safe. Just be, be safe. We, as a society, I don't think can deal with these. Frankly, these men of action who are willing to to take action that we feel is unnecessary. But keep in mind, we're all pussies. And we wouldn't do 99% of the things they see as commonplace. If someone asks you to go put your ankle in front of a 98 mile an hour slap shot, you're going to say no. Any number, every guy in the NHL, except like 10 star players, and even them, probably not, they'll just go, okay. And... We, we can't handle it emotionally. You guys got to remember that fighting is, by the rule book, illegal, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you get a five-minute penalty for it. It's not like it's free range. So I think if they start to regulate what is or isn't acceptable within an illegal action, it starts to blur that line a little bit. I personally would say, you know what, we need – you're right. Some of those fights we do need, like the again, La Cav- um La Cavalier one – but maybe we need a 10-minute major on it so that it makes guys think that, is this really worth doing? Well, I think, honestly, if you listen to Bob McKenzie when this was brought up, he, he mentioned that, look, fighting happens in hockey, and especially in levels where it's, there's no fighting allowed, it often makes it worse because guys are like, well, I guess this is happening anyway, so let's go. Uh, it's, you know... None of the players want it out. That's the other thing. 98% of them are like, no, no, keep it. And ultimately, they're the ones that have to pay the... They have to make that decision. And they've all agreed on it. They've all, you know, they've all accepted the risk. And oh, oh yeah, they're also really well compensated for it. Well, that's true. I mean, these guys make a lot more money in one year than we can probably hope to make in our lifetimes, you know, the three of us. So, yeah, they're they're accepting the risk. They're performers, really, is what it comes down to. And it is part of the performance. And, you know, you said that the players have accepted it. I don't know if they've accepted by choice or if the players union has said that it's a necessary evil. Who knows? But, yeah, I mean, it goes on. There's still guys that are employed to do that. I mean, we have McGratton on our team. That's his job. So there's definitely guys, that's their job, and they wouldn't have a job if nobody wanted to tango. And he, doesn't McGratton serve a role on this young team with a bunch of prized blue-chip rookies that we, you know, would like to protect? 
He does. I think it's good that we only have one of them instead of uh, more than one. Some teams have had more than one, and even we've had more than one enforcer in the past. But, yeah, I think he definitely has a role. And I think McGratton is probably the best guy for this job because I see McGratton as more than just a fighter. I think he's just a, he's a tough guy all the way around, and he can enforce without fighting sometimes. Plus, he's skilled at drawing penalties. Three power plays in the first three games from him. So. Oh, yeah. Every, every time I see, uh, and if you're listening, Brian McGrath, every time I see you draw a penalty, I stand up wherever I am and I applaud. I'm not getting a tattoo of you on my calf, but I- I'm really impressed with the way you play the game. Well, guys, there's a question here from Twitter this week um, asked by Darren. And he's asking, he asked us during the week, he posed us an open question. Um, does this team look like a team that perhaps Daryl Sutter would have put together? If you look at not necessarily the way they're playing or what everyone's role is, but just looking down the roster compared to the roster we've had the last couple of years here, does this look like a Daryl Sutter era team for the Flames? Forwards do sort of in that you've got your excess of 20 goal scorers. Uh, the defense... Not a chance. I think Daryl Sutter would would uh, would rather be quartered than than put this type of than put those six defensemen out on a nightly basis. Uh, but that being said, uh, yeah, and the goaltending is whatever. He he he'd do something to address that. But the forwards, I can see the Sutter comparisons. Uh. <sighs> With the forwards, definitely, like, you know, you see shades of Chris Clark in guys like Galliardi, but, you know, we don't have anybody that even remotely is anything similar to any of the defensemen that we have currently. Like, even Giordano, yeah, he's good and has been playing good thus, thus far this year, but... You know, like, he's not Regeer, and, you know, like, we don't have, like, several defensive stalwarts. Yeah. Giordano, frankly, it, it, and, and you know what, let's say, f- full on, Giordano is beasting to start this yeah. season. Best uh, he's ever he played. He is, cer- certainly, yeah, I, I, I don't think I can disagree with that, and I think it's really good for him, especially wearing the C, to come out and play well right away and not feel that pressure like we gave this guy the C. So I think that once he like I think he's already overcome a lot of objection with regard to people who might not have been confident with him as the leader going forward. And I think that's just gonna continue to allow him to build on his own game and get better. So good for you, Gio. Uh but at honestly as far, if if Gio has a comparable to our uh oh three oh four flames, it's probably Tony Lidman. If it's anyone. Maybe it's Monador. It's probably Lidman. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. When I first read Darren's question on Twitter, I went to the roster and I was looking. I didn't see the comparisons. And The first thing that jumped out to me was the number of Canadian-born players on the team this year. But most of them are from Ontario. And we know that Sutter is favored Western Canadian boys. So that's not there. But yeah, I think I'm with you guys on the forward ranks. I can see it. It does look like a team of forwards that um, Daryl might have put together. But yeah, the defense the defensive makeup is totally different than anything that Sutter would have put on the ice. For sure. And although apparently, if you're not from Toronto, you better be from the Calgary area, uh, or Finland. And of our what, f- fourteen forwards, nine of them are Canadians this year. So that's quite a big group of Canadians. Yeah. Good for us. Oh, Canada. Eh? I guess so. Yeah. Well, guys, unless there's anything you want to uh, chat about, I figured we'd start wrapping this up with the last topic on the list and something I put on Twitter earlier this week. And I'll post the uh, link to this along with the show when it's on the website. So if you're listening and you want to see these these screen grabs, you can go to the Fireside Chat website, firesidechat.ca, or you can look back in our Twitter or Facebook page. It's on there as well. But there's a supposed leak from the NHL 14... Um, video game that shows what's apparently the new Flames third jersey and it's very different than anything the Flames have had before. I know you guys have seen the photos. What do you think? 
it's lazy and hackish and like it's not here's the thing it's not a terrible jersey it's just completely uninspired and the the little flaming sea underneath the calgary letter mark uh looks like it looks like it belongs on a hoodie so the letter mark that he's talking about is a, a scripted like you know handwriting scripted font the word calgary and it yeah it looks like something you'd see on some cheap knockoff hoodie that you might buy at walmart yeah, oh yeah, it, especially with the, the shoulder bar on the back. The shoulder patches look good, I'll give them that, but... Uh, the shoulder bar is just, it doesn't even have, it's not rounded or anything, it's just a piece of black fabric that looks like they ran out of red, so they stitched black in there. It's square, it's ugly. Uh, but, come on, man. You, you don't want this. Really? Well, with that jersey, there are elements that actually look good. Well, the striping, you know, like no vertical, well, no vertical striping. You know, like the stripes. It looks like it has the retro jersey striping, but in different colors. Yeah, like if the stripes on the arms and at the bottom were a little wider, and the shoulder bar went all the way around instead of abruptly cutting off. And you had, like, the actual black flaming C instead of that word mark. It would actually look like a good jersey, but, you know, it's halfway there, and it is what it is. In a year and a half, two years, it probably get retired and some other thing will come in. I think you'd be lucky to make it out of this year. Well, how long did the horse jersey last as a third jersey? I know it moved to the away jersey for a while, but how long did that one last as a third jersey? Do you the guys horse remember? jersey makes this look like the Sistine Chapel. Or sorry, this makes the horse jersey look like the Sistine Chapel. There's something happening with the third with the horse head jersey. Yeah. Well, the, the horse head jersey, I do believe, existed as the third in the 0304 and the 0506 seasons only, and then it was retired. I actually bought one of those jerseys back in the day. I pulled the horse off of it, and I stuck a red C on it. And that's probably, I think, till to this day, one of the coolest-looking Flames jerseys I've seen. I, 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 I still have a Roman Turek horse head jersey around somewhere. Even Roman Turek probably still doesn't have one of those. Well, probably not. Although, you know what? Before I moved to Calgary from Halifax, I remember playing NHL 2000 and stacking the Calgary Flames... And uh, Chris Pronger's on the cover of that game as a blue year after he won the Hart Trophy. Uh, and that horsehead jersey is in that game. So it's been around since at least 1999. But it was the away jersey for a while, so it might have been in there as the away. Possibly. I, I, yeah, I can't it was the away jersey. jersey. Was it? Okay. Well, considering it was up against that weird red one that's like, like almost like dry blood red with the white flaming sea... Which is a real dark time for Flames uniforms. The other thing this article mentioned is that it says in September 2008, Ken King spilled to a reporter that their jerseys were in the works. So to me, if this is what we get after work since 2008, that's pretty sad. Well, the thing is, is that they probably, this is probably the exact jersey that they were going to release back then. That they just shelved it for a few years and, oh, okay. Um, yeah, which is... Did any, did everyone hear me say hackish and lazy? So you basically, we, it almost it almost looks like we got the you know the apprentice for the guy who did the uh, Buffalo Sabers script. The Buffalo Sabers jersey is actually not that bad. It works well with their color scheme, and I think this would work better. Although I'd have to look up. Does the Buffalo Sabers one have that um, have the Sabers logo underneath the buff the the word mark? Uh, yes, it does. It says Buffalo, and then under that is the the Buffalo logo. Okay, well, all right. Well, then maybe I'll give it a chance. Maybe it'll look better in yeah. person. Well, the jersey looks like New Jersey's regular home jersey, so it's not that far off. You know what? Actually, looking at this Buffalo jersey, it doesn't look bad. Um, so maybe this works. It It's, you know. Oh, wait and see. November 3rd yeah, I, is I the, when it's going to get released officially 
from what I've heard, so... Mm -hmm. But you said last week it sucks, or you've heard it sucks. Yeah. Uh, Th this doesn't exactly put those concerns to rest. No, it doesn't. But we will check back in in November once we see this thing on a real live person. And I'm hoping, I'm really hoping as a Flames fan, that this is not it. I'm hoping that this is a swerve or this is a fan jersey or something like that. But I'm really hoping this isn't what we end up I just with. hope it looks better in person. Because this will not be on my Christmas list if this is the jersey. No, that's probably fair. Well, guys, anything else you want to chat about? I would like to chat about where people can find us, Dan. Uh, the the website is firesidechat.ca. On Twitter, we are at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we are facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Or you just search Fireside Chat in that search bar because, let's be honest, you've probably all got Facebook bookmarked. And if you're not, what's wrong with you? You're missing out. 500 million friends. And we're also available for download through iTunes, and you can subscribe there. You can rate us, comment, uh, like us, and you can subscribe right through the website if you want to. We have an RSS feed on the website that's easy to subscribe to if you use a different device or if you just prefer to subscribe through another uh, podcatcher. And Lucas, if people want to find you specifically, where can they, they find can you? They can find me on Twitter, at Luke1701, that's L-U-C-1701. Uh, I'm on Facebook, but I don't want to talk to you people there. But uh, we, we, I believe, are going to start live tweeting during games. So uh, look for us on both uh, my Twitter and uh, at Fireside Podcast on Twitter. So, uh, you know, talk to us. Talk some shit. Tell us we suck. Tell us we're good. If you're going to give us a review on iTunes, click five stars. Why? Because it costs you nothing. Like this podcast. If you go to Facebook or Twitter and you uh, find us there, you'll see our brand new logo for this season is our avatar, so you can give us feedback on our logo. We'd love to know what everybody it's thinks. It's better of. than the new jersey. <laughs> That's true. I didn't use the same people that did the jersey to get our logo done. Oh my god, how great would it be if the Flames actually designed this by sending it off to a bunch of people in a sweatshop in China? <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. That... Maybe they took, you know, the pieces they liked from nine different jersey comps. I, this, the jersey does feel a bit like it was made by, like, an old woman who works on the stampede board and walks around with one of those hats looking for, <laughs> looking for mischief. <laughs> it, it looks to me like something you'd get from some Calgary Sun competition of, hey, nine-year-olds, draw your favorite Flames jersey and submit yeah. it to us. This is going to be great. Well, maybe. Matt, where uh, find I'm you? on Twitter at, at @cagedgreat, which is my CP handle. So, hell yeah, it is. And after last week, Matt's been talking a lot of hockey, and he's doubled his Twitter followers. We want to keep, keep yeah. Doubling. And I, during each road game, I'll be tweeting throughout the game. And during each home game, he'll be there drinking. Yeah, pretty much. Tweeting. You could tweet from the game. I I suppose you don't why would you want to? Well I don't usually bring my phone with me so but that's neither here nor uh, there. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You're there you're there for you're there to work. Pretty much. Work at right. drinking beer. Yeah. We'll call it work. Drinking Sounds beer good. is work. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, Matt's got eight Twitter followers after last week in one week, so let's see if we can get him another eight in the next week. So if you're uh, wanting to talk hockey during the games, you can always chat with Matt on Twitter. He's uh, he's on there. He'll be chatting with you. He's going to be tweeting during all the away games. Yep. Yeah. Let's get his followers up from Joe Colburn to Brian McGratton. There we go. Let's see if we can do it. Big Earn, please follow him. I don't personally tend to tweet a lot about hockey. I t tweet more um, about my day job, which is in the technology sphere, but I'm on Twitter at DG Stevenson. And if you need any of our Twitter handles or links, they're actually all on our website at firesidechat.ca. They're in the sidebar. You can find us there. Um, but yeah, you can follow me. I do post my flame stuff once in a while, but I'm not nearly as active in the hockey space as these two. That's why I keep them on board. Yeah, that's right. All right, so shall we wrap it up? I think so. Gentlemen, enjoy this week. We got two games coming up. We got the Canadians and we got the Devils. And let's see if we can keep getting points every game that we play for the next little bit. Yep.
Have a good one. Suck it, Tom. First Side Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.